Good morning, everyone. Jim Laird here from Largo, Florida. It is a beautiful fall day here today. I've got my dog Rommel here with me. He's uh, chewing on a marrow bone. So if, if uh, usually StreamYard's pretty good about taking out background noise, but <clears throat> if you do not, uh, if you hear that, that's what that is. That is a uh, a pit bull chewing on a marrow bone. So I was uh, sometimes I put him inside during the podcast, but it's so beautiful out this morning that. Uh, I figured I'd just let him let him do his thing. So it makes makes this a little more authentic, right? So if you're watching, please please like, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Obviously, the stuff we talk about doesn't really do great things in the algorithm. So if you could help us out, that'd be great. Uh, it's funny. I'm in Instagram jail, and um, they a friend of mine messaged me. And he had found me on Instagram and there was a warning that says, you know, this person has has shared multiple false posts. You know, the fact the fact the fact checkers have uh, deemed false. Do you really want to follow this person? <laughs> it's really funny. They put this disclaimer on my account and I have a picture of when they did that. And my followers spiked by like a lot. <laughs> it was really funny. So I don't think it was having the effect that they quite wanted. I'm sure they'll adjust their algorithms for that. But uh, I'm going to actually share that on my Instagram later. But it's pretty funny. Like my my daily stories went from like four or five hundred people seeing them to like ten. You know, so that's the powers that be. So go follow us on on Rumble. If you go to Rumble, you type in Jim Laird 44. All of these lives and broadcasts are anything I post on my YouTube channel. Uh, is automatically uploaded onto Rumble in time. I think they're a couple weeks behind, but that's basically uh, where it goes. And then it's being updated on Odyssey as well. So if YouTube ever kicks us off for whatever reason, we at least still have, you know, Rumble and Odyssey. And uh, there's talks of censoring Rumble now too. So, you know, Odyssey is a backup. So those are places. But the best way you can keep up with what we're doing is on our email list. Um, because if we all of a sudden disappear from social media, uh, the email list is really the only way we can get to you. So go to stillmanwellness.com. There'll be a pop-up for the five biggest health mistakes. Put your email in there. That'll put us on the list, put you on the list. And once you're on that list, one of the bonuses is we're doing every week, we're doing a webinar for our courses. We're constantly doing new content for the fundamentals of wellness, uh, and other courses that we're building and we're going to be able to let you come in and watch that for free um so this week is going to be on diet and blood pressure last week we did one called blood pressure secrets this is going to be in our what we call wellness secrets or something secret you know the, the cat titles are fun and catchy uh which is a little mini course inside of the fundamentals of wellness with coaching um so anyone that gets into the coaching program is going to get continuous you know strength and conditioning continuous um updates on um different issues and then we we also will take an issue that 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 somebody's interested in and we'll we'll get in depth on it and we'll we'll upload that onto the fundamentals of wellness course with coaching so get on the email list that way every week you can get a webinar it's at 10 a.m on thursdays this week we're doing it in the afternoon i can't remember exactly what time it is but there'll be an email going out tonight and an email going out wednesday night um basically with the link so you can register for it it's on Streamyard, and then the cool thing is, is if you can't make it at 10 they'll send you a replay and you'll be able to watch the replay of it later so that way you can watch the replay and then of course if you have questions um, you can always opt into the fundamentals of wellness with a uh, course with coaching you can come on here and ask questions we'll do our best to to answer your questions um, if you have any questions today please feel free to throw it in the chat but what most people don't understand when it comes to exercise, and this is really life in general, right? So it's kind of the yin and the yang, right? And you have to have light to have darkness. You have to have, you know, you have to have despair and struggle in order to experience joy and, and all that sort of thing. So there has to be a balance, right? And so I think there's this, like, whether it was a diet or exercise, You'll have a couple people have success with a modality and then they will think that everyone needs to do that. And what people don't understand is that 
every type of exercise or modality has trade-offs. There's no free lunch, right? So if I get someone really strong, like especially in squats, like, you know, back squat, deadlift, that is a compression strategy that involves holding your breath, okay? When you hold your breath, when you, you know, when you don't breathe through an exercise, that takes away your ability to move because it makes you more stiff so that you can have massive force production, okay? In the beginning, if you have someone who's like too limber and too loosey-goosey and you put them on a strength training program, you know, we see this a lot with women that I've trained that have incontinence issues, they've had a couple children, they've forgotten how to engage their middle, they engage their middle and all of a sudden their incontinence goes away. But after a few years, if all you do is lift them heavy, all of a sudden those adaptations that were positive in the beginning might start to become a negative. You might start having, you know, back discomfort, knee discomfort, depending on the position of the pelvis. And a lot of it is, is, is not being able to shut the strategy off that you're in. So, and you'll have this with power lifters, bodybuilders. I know I experienced this. I was taking that strategy that I was using to deadlift six, 700 pounds or squat eight, 900 pounds plus that compression, super tight, high rev strategy. And I was bringing it into my everyday life. I wasn't able to shut that off. Right. And so there's things we can do in our training, particularly post-training to shut off that strategy, to manage it. Right. Um, cause when you're, when you're trying to lift heavy, heavy weights, like really heavy, like, you know, 800, 900 pound squats, it's not about health. Okay. And it's, it's kind of like high performance is kind of like walking on a tightrope, Right. Um, you know, the, the difference between being successful and not successful is like millimeters. Right. And with somebody who's a high level performer, they only do need to do enough to basically keep them from spinning out of control. Because if you take away what makes them great, um, they're going to lose their ability to perform. Like I remember they were talking about Deion Sanders and he had tight hamstrings. And you'll know that, you know, if you work with, with athletes, basketball players, sprinters, that tightness and the, the ability to relax and then snap, relax and snap. That's, you know, sprinters look really relaxed, but, you know, they're able to snap, um, produce that force into the ground. Um, they started stretching Dion's hamstrings and they, well, it, and basically by doing that, they, they changed his pelvic position. Uh, we, we won't get into that. That's a deep rabbit hole, but they noticed he started losing explosive power. So Dion's like, no, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, like these NBA guys, if you take away that stiffness or Hussein Bolt, if you try and correct interior, uh, Hussein Bolt's interior pelvic tilt or any sprinter's interior pelvic tilt, they're not going to be able to run as fast. Okay. So all of a sudden you took away what makes them great. Now, what you don't want to do with Hussein Bolt or a Deion Sanders is drive that extended position that makes them really fast even further, because there comes a point where that extended position becomes a massive liability if you cannot do the opposite. Okay. And people would always say to me, I'll have people do something called a rope squat which is basically they hold on to a rope. They actually flex and re they, they round their spine. They get into flexion and they squat, right? And people would always say to me that, well, that's bad. That's bad. It's not bad. Now, I wouldn't have somebody squat like that with a big load on their back. But most people coming into the gym, and there are some exceptions to this. That's why you can't just paint a broad brush for everybody. I can't just write a general program for everyone. There's going to be nuance, right? Most of the people that come to me over the years are in this extended state where their, their pelvis is dumped forward, they're arched. So if I can provide something in the warm up that takes them all the way to the other extreme without hurting them, they're going to have a much better chance of being somewhere in the middle when they perform the task, right? So I would always do things like that as part of a warm up for those people. Now, certain people, uh, like Dr. Stillman, we're going to do inverted things because he he has, and I'm going to do things that allow him to push back into his pelvis because he's got a sway back. His his guts are pushing forward. He can't hinge very well. So 
the warm up that I do with people is going to vary based on their structure and their presentation and their strategy, right? The human body is absolutely resilient and can handle just about anything as long as the, the, the stressor is, is as long as you start with a low enough stressor, the human body can adapt to all sorts of stuff. The problem is in our modern world today, most people, this is general advice for most people, because they're not moving around and moving in different ways and bending and picking things up in weird ways and, and doing different things do not have that general movement library, general base to handle even moderate amounts of exercise without going into this survival strategy. <clears throat> and I'll see people lifting and they're doing very simple things and they're holding their breath for it, or they'll do their floor warm up. And, and for power, somebody like a power lifter who I'm trying to teach to become really tight and produce a lot of force, there is some merit to warming up stiff, right? Doing a bird dog with a fent with a clenched fast fist and all that sort of stuff. But you have to, one of the best things you can do is get down on the floor and roll around on the floor, like grab your knees and roll back and forth. I call it turtle, you know, do that and do like a 180 while you're, ro while you're rocking oh, a 180, the other direction, uh, you know, roll up into a V sit, roll up into a single leg, you know, hamstring reach. If you go on my YouTube, if you go on YouTube channel and you type, type in uh, feel good circuits, um, it's going to pull up some examples of some of the things that I would do with people uh, just getting down on the floor. If you get down on the floor and you move around in different ways every day for like five to 10 minutes, you're going to feel way better. Okay. And there's some nuance to that. If I've got someone who's hypermobile, which means they can move their joints past a normal range of motion, hyperextend elbows, hyperextend spines. They can do all sorts of things. I, I, I'm going to choose different warm-up stuff for them than somebody like me who's super stiff, right? Because if I take someone who's hypermobile and I, I drive that hypermobility, you can actually you can start, you know, how many women I've had trained that have, uh, you know, torn torn hip, hip, hip capsules and messed up hip capsules because they were, they were, uh, driving they were using their hip capsule to basically create stability so when you're doing exercise you want to make sure there's some exercise that involves breathing relaxed and normally while you're doing the exercise okay some of your warm-up stuff some of your different exercises and then when you're going to produce force deadlifting heavier things or doing something that requires a lot of effort you're going to want to learn how to brace to produce force but then when you're done training you're going to want to shut that off that's why i have people like round over a stability ball and breathe or get on the floor in a 90 90 and just breathe in and out through their nose when they're done hang in a deep squat from the smith machine these things all help shut off that high threshold strategy most people because they have such a low level base of preparedness um you know, I worked with a lady yesterday who actually uh, is having some, some, some back discomfort. And the reason is, is every exercise she was doing, she was basically using her back. She was jamming into her spine for push-ups, for ab wheel, for everything she was doing. She was doing in a hard arch. She could barely flex her spine. She had very little, um, flexion. You know, when I put her in a bird dog, she would go up and her you know, her, her foot would go way above her butt and her, you know, her body would tilt forward, collapse forward. And, you know, I would have to teach her not to go past that because she had too much there. But when she went to go this way and touch her elbow to her knee, not only did she almost fall over sideways, um, she could barely touch her elbow to her knee. And for, for a petite female, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a big deal. For me, my arms are really short and I'm really stiff through my upper, my back because of all the, the, the weight I've lifted over the years. But for a, a normal everyday female, um, she needs to gain some flexion back so she can live, you know, she basically, when she's brushing her teeth, she's, she's arching like JLo when she's, you know, combing her hair. Um, you know, we have to be able to shut these strategies off and use them when they're appropriate, just like blood pressure, right? We have to be able to, when you get revved up, and you, you have a threat or a confrontation or some sort of stress, you rev up, you cruise cortisol, 
the problem is, is when you lose the ability to switch off and relax and turn off and slow your breathing down and breathe through your nose, people will lose the ability to switch back and forth. And that's where they get into trouble. And the same thing is with exercise. Can you do things in a relaxed flowing state like a Tai Chi? You'd be surprised. You take like high level power lifters and you have them try and stand on one foot or you have them try and do some really simple things that involve like a little bit of hip shifting or a little bit of internal rotation of the, of the hip. And they look like they're, um, you know, on another planet, right? They're drunk. They're, they're, it's like, it's like they're failing a sobriety test, uh, but they can go, you know, and a lot of times with these power lifters, when they're warming up with the bar, they look horrible, right? It looks terrible. And then you put 135 on it, it still looks crappy as the weight gets heavier, they get better because they've created this squat suit with their body that's made them stiff that allows them to lift these big weights. Now, eventually, you know, we're our body basically rotates when it walks, it turns and rotates. And so when you train something like a power lifter that takes away rotation over time, that's why all these guys that are power lifters look like you know the unoiled tin man when they're walking because they have adapted to lifting really heavy things and they've brought that strategy into their everyday life and they've lost the ability to turn and rotate through the pelvis and through the thorax right and that has consequences okay and you might be able to get away with that for a long long time and then one day all of a sudden it, the wheels come off the wagon so the key is is to understand the difference between performance and health and then making sure that you're shutting off these high threshold strategies when you need to, to basically help you re re relax and recover and those sort of things. One of the biggest problems with, with, uh, with physical therapy, with, with the fitness industry in general is it's based on dead guy anatomy, you know, and I get this from Bill Hartman, you know, most of these concepts, uh, come from Bill Hartman and come from my wrestling background. Um, a lot of the things that I do throughout my career are based on wrestling uh, low level gymnastics. And, um, so, and Bill basically taught, has taught me, you know, since around 2008, 2009, um, why this stuff makes a difference and has helped me understand the trade-offs that are involved with training. Right. Cause most people think there's, you know, it's a free lunch. Right. And he's the one that's pointed this out, you know, dead guy anatomy so the dead guy it's all hinges and levers right when you have a live human there's gravity and there's fluid right and pressure fluid drives a lot of the shape of our exoskeleton pressure does that as well and what happens is is when you have someone who's highly compressed you know say they say they're 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 in the j-lo position they're using compression to get their strategy what happens to things that are highly compressed? You get less fluid flow, less blood flow into these areas. So what people don't understand is if you are using compression, whether it's through your upper back or through your, you know, in your shoulder, like say you're highly compressed on this left side, you know, this is all compressed and your low back's compressed, you know, you're, cause you're in this arch, you know, whether it's a sway back or, 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 you know, we open scissor, you know, pelvis rib cage. If you're constantly in that state, of compression and you're using that to function not only is it going to basically affect what's up and down the chain you know as far as your ability to move your hips and your ability to for your knee to function properly and your foot uh the ability for you you know most of the time people will say well your glutes are inactive well that's not true unless you're dead like your muscles are always active it's just whether they're in the right position to do the job that they need to do it's kind of like if i take you out in the parking lot i put a van in neutral and I tell you to push it standing straight up. It's not that you're weak. It's just that you're in a bad position, right? Now, if I put you in a better position and you still can't move the van, then that means you're weak, right? And we need to get stronger. We need to learn how to create pressure to, to apply force, right? But most people are going to be able to push a car if they're, they're down low and they get up on their toes and they, and they engage and they push, right? Same thing with the body. Like, you know, if your pelvis is in a certain position, it's put certain muscles in positions where they don't have the leverage to actually do what they're supposed to do. And um, so if you're always compressed, you're going to not get fluid into certain areas. And guess what happens when you don't get fluid into certain areas? That area doesn't heal. That area becomes inflamed. 
And that's why a lot of people that are, you know, lift really heavy things end up with hip replacements and back surgeries and things like that. Because over time, the lack of nutrition, the lack of fluid into that area causes problems, right? And so, and the same with like the knee. So, you know, most people don't understand the knee works on a, like a torque, like a twisting towel and same with the elbow. So if you lose the ability to, to internally, externally rotate through your hip, your body's going to make up throughout, through the knee. So a lot of times the knee problem is actually up the chain. And a lot of people kind of miss that completely. So that's why this stuff is, is really interesting. And it, it's in this business, you know, though, everyone has to do a Jefferson curl. Okay. Which is a, a, a basically a rounded, very deep, stiff legged deadlift, which if really light, and if you're really, really extended like me, if I do a really light Jefferson curl, that is actually going to help me if it's light enough. If I rush too quickly, it can cause some problems. But because it's taking me to the opposite extreme that I'm stuck in, it actually has a benefit for me. Now, Dr. Stillman, who can't hinge and can't push his butt back, that is not going to help Dr. Stillman very much. It's probably going to cause a problem for him because he, 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 he can't push his guts back. And so he's going to have some, some issues with getting his shift back and it's going to put a lot of torque on his back. But even with him, a thing like a Jefferson curl, if you start with a broomstick or you start with a medicine ball, you can adapt to that. It's just what adaptation do you want and what are the trade-offs? That's why Dr. Stillman constantly bugs me. Like you need to write a exercise program for people. And I'm like, it's not that simple. <laughs> if I take somebody who's a, a, you know, who's very stiff is going to look totally different. Their training program is going to look totally different than someone who is very loose and limber uh, and depending on their goals. And the way I do an exercise is going to be totally different than Dr. Stillman because Dr. Stillman is a big tube, right? And he rotates really well. He's a narrow and fisternal angle. He's great rotation. I'm the opposite. I am a big cinder block. I'm like a dragster straight line. I will run you over, right? There's no, there's no avoiding. Like when I played football, I'd be running down the sidelines and I would cut back into somebody and hit them because I know I'm not going to be able to like, you know, run around them. I would punish them. And then, you know, I'd hit somebody two or three times and then they'd get scared when I go to hit them. And then I'd just like pretend I was going to hit them and then I'd keep going and then I'd get tackled from behind because my top end speed is, is not that great. My, my zero to 60, you know, I had one of the fastest, you know, 10 yard bursts on every football team that I've been on wrestling team too. I'm really good in like two or three, four steps. And that's why I was a fullback. And that's why I was a good wrestler. Right. I'm not a good top end runner. Right. So my, my game is torque. Right. And so that's why certain body types do really well in certain sports and other body types do not. Right. So like baseball or golf or things like that, will I be able to like, because I'm a good athlete, will I be able to like compensate and rotate through places that I'm not supposed to rotate through and maybe be okay? Sure. But in the long haul, that's going to have consequences because my body is not designed to do that. Okay. People, people don't want to hear that either. Our parents, especially when they're wor I'm working with their children and they want their children to play a certain sport. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Is this for fun? Or do you really want to get serious about this? And they're like, well, serious. We want to take it as high as we can. And I'm like, well, you don't really have the body type for this sport. Um, you might maybe want to look at some other sports that the body, that this body type is better for. I had a, had a guy that, that was a really good uh, basketball player, <clears throat> probably one of the best, uh, high school basketball players in Kentucky ever. Right. And he grew, um, he maxed his height out in like grade eight. Right. And so they focused solely on basketball and he played center and he didn't really learn how to dribble. He didn't learn how to bring the ball up the floor. He just focused on being the best center. And he probably was the best high school center in the history of Kentucky high school basketball. He was that good. Well, come to the end of his high school career. And this guy was a really good swimmer too, like high level swimmer could have been like, he was built like 
perfect for swimming. Probably could have been an Olympian. He was that good. But they put it, they went all in on basketball. Well, he was 6'4 in the eighth grade. He never grew past that. So he goes to go to college and he can't play center in college at 6'4. And he doesn't have the skills to bring the ball up the floor or to play a different position. So he ended up having to go to a smaller school, which is fine. But this guy could have been a, like a world-class swimmer, world-class. And he might've been able to play a different position if he'd have learned how to dribble with both hands, if he'd been comfortable bringing the ball up the floor. But all the coaches he had wanted to win. So he played center. He didn't learn how to play any other positions, right? When you're young, you're, you're a young baseball player, young volleyball player, young basketball player. You should play every position on the floor, right? No matter what your, your height, no matter what's going on, because up to the age of 16, competitive or not sports should be about teaching, learning, and developing, not winning, right? Once you get over 16, then it starts to become more serious and becomes more about winning. And then you start putting the places, you know, kids in the positions they need to be in to be successful. But you have these middle school coaches that are more concerned about winning the middle school world cha uh, champion or the state championship in middle school than they are developing the potential of the athlete down the road. And I've seen this before. We had another kid that I worked with that could not, incredible, He's a, he played basketball in Europe for a while, played at a couple different Division I schools, um, was drafted by one of the most prominent basketball programs in the country to begin, or no, not drafted, signed, this is college. Um, I mean, it's almost like the draft. But he couldn't dribble with his left hand. And he was so much faster than everyone else in high school that it didn't matter. Well, until we ran into a really, really good team that was had a really smart coach, and they're like, just make him go left. And the guy across from him was just as fast as him and just as good athletically, and he couldn't go left. So he, they just forced it and totally threw everything off. We ended up losing that game in the, in the state semifinal, I think. But he didn't want to work on his complete game, right? So if he'd have done some different things instead of what he was really good at, um, he, he could have been a really good NBA player. He played in Europe for a while, but he, he went to this one college and he didn't play and he ended up transferring somewhere else. And then he finally started figuring out he needed to improve his game. And he started working on a lot of these things that he should have been working on. But a great sports coach would not let that happen. A great sports coach is going to teach the fundamentals across the board in the beginning and then tailor the what needs to happen based on the athlete. Glenn Perch uh, was my wrestling coach in high school and was an absolute, absolute savage when it came to fundamentals. We used to practice arm drags for like 45 minutes, just basically arm dragging. And, and, and to this day, if somebody puts their hand on my arm, I will, I will arm drag them without even thinking about it. Like that happened to me like a couple months ago, somebody just walked up and grabbed my wrist and I just went like this and spun them around. Um, it was really funny. <laughs> I was like, don't put your hands on me. I've had that happen to me before. I actually, this is a really funny story. I was in Lexington years ago and, um, I was, uh, in the mall and they have these these tables set up, you know, and they, they sell these things. And uh, they always come and, like, get really aggressive. And I'm walking by this table. <clears throat> and this guy, I, I can't remember what where he was from, but he basically walked up behind me and grabbed my arm so hard that it pulled me off my feet. And so I immediately spun into him, sunk my hip into him, grabbed his head and hip tossed him and landed right on top of him. And of course, security came and they called the police. And cause I, I, I mean, I hammered this guy into the floor hard cause it, it just like, I was off. He pulled my arm and he put me on this side and I was just like, what's going on here? You know, here's somebody grab it, putting their hands on me in public. And I immediately went to like, destroy, punish, defend, right? So I immediately spun, I put my hip in him and I hip tossed him and slammed him in the ground and landed on top of him, knocked the wind out of him. And of course, you know, they're, they're getting after me, you know, there's talk of charges being pressed until we go look at the, they're like, what happened? You know, why did you slam this guy onto the ground? I said, he grabbed me. 
So we go watch the, we sit down, you know, the police are all upset. The mall's upset. We go into the video room and they sit down. I said, watch the tape. And so this guy, literally, you can see him grab my arm and like, I come up on my foot and I immediately go to my wrestling. Boom. And the police were like, yeah, dude, you assaulted this guy. <laughs> so like you, you know, he slammed you on your back and you, I think I broke a couple of his ribs. Uh, he's like, you, you got what you deserve. So I was allowed to leave and the guy was fired and the guy, you know, was probably a very sore for a long time, but that's the kind of instincts that was installed in me. Thousands of repetitions, thousands of repetitions. So if you're a parent of a young athlete, if you're, you know, playing, ba if you're a coach of a young baseball team, a T-ball team. Even if you lose and explain this to the parents, like, look, we're working on the fundamentals here. So your kid has a chance to be successful at a higher level. Cause if you have little Johnny and he can play first place, second place, third base, shortstop outfield, and he can catch, and he's a decent at pitching at a young age. Plus this will keep them from getting like overuse injuries and things like that, but they'll find one or two kids that are really good at pitching because they're basically develop a lot faster than a lot of the kids. And they have the coordination because a lot of them are like shorter and stockier and they'll over pitch that kid because he's really good. But the kids that are going to be the major league guys are the more lanky guys that are probably goofy at like 12 and 13 and can't pitch well. They don't have great coordination. Those are the guys that end up going to the next level. Those guys that are the early to bloomers they end up blowing their arm off. And most of these schools now, baseball schools, they won't recruit from the deep south because the pitching in particular because they know these kids have been overpitched and they're going to blow up. Once they get there, they go to the more Northern States where these kids can't throw as much. Right. So they get kids at less miles on them. But if we started looking at this from a development standpoint, instead of a winning standpoint, um, it would be a totally different game where you want to develop those fundamental. And so Glenn Perch, we learned all the fundamental things of wrestling. And then once you learn that, then he taught me moves that were specific for my body type. Like I'm really good at inside control, arm drags, low ankle picks, blowing through somebody. I have really good sidestep. So I would use my speed because also I'm, I was wrestling, you know, 220 plus and I was, you know, right at 220, 230, 240, you know, somewhere in there. And I was so much more explosive and faster than the guys I was wrestling. So I used my speed and I was really good at certain things. There's other guys that are long and lanky. They're not going to play the inside game. They're going to go outside. They're going to shoot from longer distances because they got longer reach. So, you know, if you'll go to wrestling, you know, out of high school and they'll give every guy on the team the same moves. The fundamentals need to be the same. But it's just like when you're dealing with a certain quarterback, like a Tom Brady, the, the system that Tom Brady plays in is going to be totally different than the system Patrick Mahomes plays in. And a good coach is going to take what Tom Brady does well and develop a system around that quick release, quick reads. You know, Patrick Mahomes, roll him out. You know, you know we, we can get away with doing things with Patrick Mahomes that we, we can't do with Tom Brady. But a good coach is going to take someone's strengths and basically build on that right and so my wrestling coach would customize every guy had moves that were built for their their strengths and for their their we their their basically their uh what they were really good at and what their body structure would allow them to do because there's a, like in jujitsu when i do jujitsu and i've messed around with this like there's no way i could be uh like a black belt or whatever, because I can't do half the moves that are jujitsu generally was developed for like longer, lanky people, <clears throat> smaller statued people. Like there's certain moves I can't get into in jujitsu. Right. I just can't, I just can't do it. My arms aren't long enough. My legs aren't long enough. So I have to kind of like have my own little style of jujitsu. And always my wrestling background, when I would go roll with guys, it would always mess them up because they'd put, try to put me in a triangle and I'd actually let them because I could stack them up and bend them in half and then pretty much do whatever I want to do to them. Um, so I have to have 
I had a, a great guy. I, I did a couple, uh, a couple, you know, before like in early two thousands, late nineties, uh, before like MMA was really popular. Well, it was popular, but it just wasn't like it is today. I did a couple like semi-pro pro fights and I had a coach in, in Lynchburg that basically developed a whole style of jujitsu just for me. He's like, we're going to learn this. We're going to learn this. And you're, these are your three things that you're going to do. And this is how you defend this. And this is how you defend that. And this is, you're going to make them fight your game. Right. And so there's not a lot of that going on right now. There's not a lot of nuance as far as like, whether it's with fitness, you know, personal trainers, everybody doing the same program. I mean, I can even teach a group class and I can basically have 20 people and I've been doing it for so long. I can adjust the exercise, the same exercise for each person based on their body type, just by regressing them and, and progressing them according to what each structure needs. I can watch and I, because I've been doing it for so long. I'd be like, well, that person needs to, you know, they had need to have the weight out in front of them. That person needs to have the weight on this side. This person needs to have a box to squat off of. This person needs that. This person needs that based on putting them in the best position that's going to give them what they want. Whereas most people, they, you know, they go to a class, um, you know, I'm the way I'm going to instruct mobility is going to be totally different or approach mobility is going to be totally different for someone who's a yogi as opposed to a powerlifter, right? The yogi and the powerlifter cannot do the same mobility program, nor do they need to. You make the yogi more mobile, you might cause problems. You make the power lifter, it's almost impossible to make them uh, too mobile. But if you do the wrong mobility drills with the power lifter, not only are you going to hurt them, uh, you might make them worse at what they do, right? So you've got to know what the end goal is and you've got to know the trade-offs, right? Who you're working with, what their goal is, is the strategy they're using might not be ideal, but is that how they perform at a high level? And if so, how do we manage that so it doesn't become a problem? And that's where this all the art and the science, the art, you know, that's it's not cut and dry. It's a, it's an art, and that's why I love it so much. A lot of it is experimentation. You know, Doctor Silma, like, how did you know that, or how did you do that, or how did you learn that by failing a lot, by trying different things with different people and being like, well, that didn't that didn't work on that body shape. Oh well, uh, we need to make an adjustment. Um, that's not the outcome we wanted. Okay. That worked for two or three years. Now, what do we do? You know, you, there's a, there's a really good example of this and, and, and I love, I love Charles Poliquin. Um, but he kind of, uh, missed the boat on a couple different things. He had a guy and obviously you can't, and Tiger Woods is another good example of this. And I can't definitively say that this is what ruined their career. There's all sorts of factors, but in my opinion, David Boston was a great wide receiver. <clears throat> and Charles Poliquin wanted, you know, th there's this kind of camp that's like, well, all they need to do is get stronger. All they need to do is get more powerful. And that worked for a little while. David put on some muscle, but then Charles took it to the point where it was ridiculous. I mean, David Boston looked like a professional bodybuilder. He had put on like 50 or 60 pounds and he started having hamstring pulls and he started having injuries and he ended up washing out of the league. So he got so big and strong and muscular that it took away from his ability to play football. Now, Tiger Woods had all sorts of shenanigans off the field that probably, you know, off the field, off the golf course that probably contributed to a lot of his issues. But Tiger got into CrossFit. He got into lifting really heavy weights. He was really concerned about benching really heavy weights. What happens when you start benching over 300, 400 pounds? In the beginning, it might not have affected him that much, but over time, when you're bench pressing three, 400, 500, you know, three or 400 pounds on a regular basis, that causes massive amounts of compression. You have to com use compression to create that much force, especially moving heavy things. What does compression do? It takes away from your ability to move. So over the years, Tiger was doing these, you know, military training. He was doing, you know, lifting really heavy things, which I would not do for a golfer. That's a rotational sport. So guess what happens? He starts losing the ability to rotate through his whole body and his thorax and, you know, through his upper back. You know, like if, if, if you're really strong in the bench press, you're going to have limited mobility through your thorax. I've gotten way better 
um, you know, because I, I do a lot of alternate pressing and things like that. Now, I, I rarely do normal bench. But, you know, when I was benching 500, you know, I, you know, benching over 500 pounds raw, my mobility through my shoulders, and my, I mean, I built a bench shirt essentially with my body and my ability to turn. So guess what? Tiger gets stronger and bigger. And all of a sudden he starts rotating through places he's not supposed to rotate. And he ends up having eight or nine back surgeries. Now I can't say that 100% for sure. That's what happened. But you know, when you make, when you take a golfer and you take away what they're really good at for them to basically, which really heavy lifting. And I've worked with golfers that needed to learn how to get a little more stiff. So a little bit of lifting in the beginning helped them, but over the long haul, you know, uh, I've worked with soccer players too, and, and wrestlers that once they get to a certain point on the deadlift, that's enough. All we need to do is maintain that strength and then basically make sure that they don't get any more stiff or lose the ability to move in certain ways in order to get, you know, once that deadlift for a wrestler is X amount of weight, you know, maybe it's 350 or whatever, maybe more, maybe 400 pound trap bar deadlift. There's no point in getting to the 500. It's not going to help them that much and it might even make them worse. So understanding the context of who you're working with and how it applies to their goals and their specific uh, context matters. And then also what strategy are they using and how can I manage that strategy so they don't lose the variability to switch back and forth in what they're doing. And then when you take someone into the competitive season, you're actually going to take some of that variability away so they can perform at a high level. And that's why you have an off, an off season. The off season is actually to do more general things, to bring back fitness, to bring back variability. So they have, you know, you, you've, you've narrowed them down to a certain point. And then basically at the end of the season, what's supposed to happen is, is you take them back to a more bigger, broader base, right? So they can narrow back down and then go back out because if you keep narrowing, you keep narrowing, you keep narrowing, you keep narrowing, eventually you run out of room. Right. So I know that's a little longer than usual. I just got on a roll, decided to roll with it. So get on our email list for how, you know, diet and blood pressure this week, this Thursday, I believe it's in the afternoon, but even if you can't make it, uh, you'll basically get a replay to that. <clears throat> so get on the email list, stillmawellness.com. Put your email list. Oh, tomorrow we're going to be doing a get ready for winter. If you're in the Northern hemisphere, high latitude show. And part of that, um, Dr. Stillman loves the sauna and he loves the sauna space. It's sitting right inside in there and he loves it. Even in the middle of summer, he sits in the damn thing. I don't know how he does it, but I literally sweat while I'm sitting out here. Uh, you know, that's just how it goes, I guess, when you weigh 250, but Loves a sauna space. And sauna space is running a get ready for winter special. So if you go to sauna space and um, use the code Stillman in all caps, you'll get 10% off of anything from sauna space. So we will get into the details of what you do uh, in the winter tomorrow when Dr. Stillman joins me. Uh, he had an appointment this morning. And James says, Jim, I am 60 year old beginner who has not touched a weight for years. What can I do to prevent injury, tendons, shoulders, knees, et cetera? My goals are modest. Well, Jim, without looking at you, um, I can't really give you specific advice, but I'll give you some general advice. Um, one of them is getting down and up and down off the floor. So just simply get down on the floor, lay flat on your back, roll to your left and get up. Okay. Get back down on the floor lay flat, roll to your right and get up and then try and alternate the leg you use to get up. Just doing that a couple times a day is going to make a big, big difference. And then if you go to my YouTube channel and you type in feel good circuits, there's a th three, maybe two or three, four on there, the floor based stuff, um, where you're doing like knee circles and quadruped, you're rocking on your back, back and forth, bird dogs, Start doing lots of really simple things uh, on the floor every day. And then you want to lift like two to three days a week. But you want to make sure when you lift that you're really focusing on getting stacked. 
because when your pelvis is in this position and your rib cage is all is everything's lined up that allows the shoulder blade to move the way it's supposed to it allows the knee the the the, the hips to get the most amount of external rotation internal rotation available to it and it's going to be much more efficient and it fixes most people's issues just by focusing on getting the stack you know so when you're doing a push-up you're literally going to have your belly button and your pelvis pulled together and it's going to feel like you're rounded but you're not and when you're doing the push-up you want to make sure you reach so most people will do a push-up and they'll just do this you know and their shoulder blades are pinned together so you want to push and you want to reach right and same with like when you're doing a pull down most people will arch way back and they'll do the pull down. They'll squeeze those shoulder blades together and they, they'll come up, but they can't go all the way because they're not here. So when you do like a pull down, stack your rib cage and your pelvis, it's going to feel real weird. It's almost going to be like you're sitting forward and then basically um, up you go. And then I, I'm, you know, all my beers of bench pressing, I can't go all the way up, but I have a better range of motion when I'm here, as opposed to when I'm arched, like there's when I'm arched. Right. So getting the stack in place uh, you can look on my on my um, youtube channel i have specific um examples of different exercises on my channel if you want more specific help uh, i do that in the fundamentals of wellness with coaching um where i literally i get on a weekly group call with people there's 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 a weekly group call with me there's a call with dr stillman and myself on the second saturday of every month. And then the third Saturday of every month, I do an additional Q&A. So five Q&As with me, one with me and Dr. Stillman. There's a whole course in there. I'm putting a beginner strength training program in there. I will literally, I will look at you on the call and I will make specific content just for you. And I will share it on there so other people can learn. And I will help you with that. We're about to release an app to not only track people's goals, uh, send them a daily check-in of, the, of like some fundamental things, a weekly check-in so we can have some accountability. And eventually I'll be building that app out with exercise and all sorts of great things. And if you go over to the Stillman Wellness and you sign up for the Fundamentals of Wellness with Coaching right now uh, and use the code JIM, capital J-I-M, you'll get 10% off. Uh, but Dr. Stillman has instructed me to raise the price from 99 to 199 today. So I'll give you till noon to do that. If you want to join the coaching, uh, where I can give you specific guidance, if you're not already in there, uh, we have a couple of James's in there, but, uh, and I know you're here all the time and I really appreciate you showing up. Um, so if you want specific guidance where I can actually look at how you move and help you make good exercise selection choices. Uh, and then there's a whole library of there of different warm up stuff. But the key is, is moderate to low level activity daily and then throwing a little bit of intensity in from time to time. And if you haven't done anything, you only need to do like full body circuits and it doesn't have to be insane. It doesn't have to be like super hard at first. You can make some really great gains just by doing moderate intensity and really focusing on you know, developing the neurological drive and the position that you need and reinforcing good position, but just moving around in different ways. If you do one of those feel good circuits, you know, obviously if anything hurts, don't do it. But if you do one of those floor based circuits every day that I put on my YouTube channel, the one where I'm rocking back and forth, like a tur like on my back, I call it turtle. I guarantee you, you do that every day for like a month, come back and come back on here and tell me how you feel. Uh, you will be a different person. The floor is a great teacher. And we need to spend more time moving around on the ground. Um, most people would do way, way better. Uh, just think about, you know, at 60, when's the last time you actually got down on the floor and crawled? You know, people used to change their own oil. They'd get down on the ground. They'd crawl under a vehicle, you know, you know, on their back. And, you know, they just did different things. They moved in ways that people don't move today at all. Most people don't move at all. They become, you know, chair, chair, chair Olympians, right? So thank you for that. Ah, uh, Mr. Habermill, how are you? I coached young Clay when he was in high school. Uh, great guy, good athlete. Um, good morning, Jim. How do you get young athletes to understand athletic skill development is more important than winning? Uh, I would say the 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 difference. Um, I would say 
uh, developing athleticism because most of these kids, they're doing skill work too much. They're not doing enough athletic work. Um, how do you keep them encouraged through their journey? The same way I encouraged you, you know, remember when we first started working together, don't worry about how much weight you're lifting, worry about how you're lifting it. Right. You know, don't do things that hurt your back just to impress the coaches. Right. On, you know, mentoring, teaching, Hey, look, you know, it's not about how good you are right now in the eighth grade. I want you to be at your best when it matters. And then understanding that there needs to be some balance. The, the biggest thing, the one, one thing you can do to keep for kids is just make it fun, right? Until they're a little older, but keep it fun at first and explain to them that sports is a means to develop character, to develop the ability to deal with difficult people, difficult coaches, difficult situations, to learn how to win and lose. There's a reason why businesses hire athletes because athletes know how to win and lose. They know how to handle wins. They know how to handle losses. They know how to handle adversity. Non-athletes don't. They don't really get that kind of training. That's what sports does. So you got to explain to them that the sports is a means to an end. And then you'll also have to get them to explain that they have value beyond their sport. A lot of the kids that I work with, the sport was their identity. You know, I was like that. I'm Jim Laird. I play football. That's who I am. It should have been, I'm Jim Laird, who happens to be a great person and very valuable, but happens just to play football. But I'm not a football player. Like, that's not who I am. You know, I'm not a, like, a re being a wrestler is not who I am. It's something I do, right? And I would have, I think I had this conversation with you. I've had this conversation with a lot of the kids that I worked with at, at your high school. I worked with a lot of, a lot of kids at Clay's high school and, you know, some really good athletes. One day this is going to end, you know, 14, you know, talking to a 14, 15 year old kid. I actually had two or three of them reach out to me here in the last, a couple of them, you know, uh, they were younger, just either had retired from, you know, th their career came to an end at the end of college or whatever. I actually have a, a, a soccer player who's going through that right now that I've been working with, you know, for the last several years. And I've had these conversations like, do you have other hobbies? Do you have other interests? What are you going to do when you're done? You know, and I had one, one guy was like, you know, he's like, I'm glad you got me ready for this because like, I've had somebody, you know, he was like, what do I do? Like, I don't have anybody to tell me what to do anymore. Like I've been told where to be, what to eat, how to lift, you know, since I was 11 and now I'm on my own. So that's a big, you know, a big part of it too is, but you basically want to tell them like when they're younger, this is the time to become a complete athlete. You can always learn a skill later, right? But athleticism has a very small window to develop. And you want to develop as much athleticism and play as many different things as you can when they're young. And then as they get older, you can up the skill work. But most of these kids in practice are doing stuff that's way too advanced. And that's why a lot of them are getting hurt. So, Clay, you're just going to talk to them like I talk to you and basically talk to them about long-term development, long-term outlook, and not instant gratification. And that's another thing sports teaches too, is our culture is so instant gratification based uh, with the phone, you know, scrolling, which, you know, I get trapped in sometimes, but you got, you know, basically it's a mentorship and it's basically about getting them to understand that, Hey, in order for you to have the best, best opportunity for you to play at the highest level possible, you need this foundation. You need this base. You need to learn how to play different positions. You need to learn to move in different ways. And then when you get a little older, we can get very specific about what we need to do with you once you have that general base of movement library, right? So, because once you learn how to do a double play, your brain understands what has to happen in that. You don't have to practice every single variation of the double play. The body will basically figure it out. The brain will figure it out. But if you don't have that movement library to move in a way to do the double play, your brain's, your brain's going to really struggle. So that's why it's so important to have kids experience different movement patterns, different sports, tracking the ball above your head, tracking the ball, moving your feet, you know, tracking the ball with your hands, 
you know, all these things carry over into different sports, being able to like track somebody, understand that the pursuit angle that you need to take. That's why, you know, you know, having kids play ultimate Frisbee, having kids play, you know, ta- you know, flag football, having kids do, you know, soccer, having them play tennis, even if it's for fun, even if it's just hitting the ball back and forth, um, you know, tag, having them move in chaotic situations. That all goes like that movement library you build when you're young is how these guys like Patrick Mahomes and some of these dudes can make these insane plays because they have that big movement library because they played multiple sports when they were growing up. I don't, I can't think of any high level NFL guy, really high level NFL guy that couldn't have gone professional in more than one sport. Brady could have played baseball. Mahomes could have played baseball. Gretzky could have played baseball or lacrosse. Um, you know, Shaq could have played basketball. He was, he, or Shaq could have, he did play basketball. He could have played football if he really wanted to. I mean, he'd have gotten his knees hacked to death. LeBron played football. He could have played football in the NFL if he wanted to. Uh, Kobe played soccer at a very high level. And obviously Kobe Bryant doesn't have a soccer body, but he was very good from what I understand. So developing that, you know, wide base of support. I mean, look at Dion, look at Bo Jackson, all these guys, you know, like just about every NFL quarterback could have played, could have pitched baseball or did, you know, John Elway was a great baseball pitcher. So, you know, it's about mentoring, it's about being patient. And, uh, so, but I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you checking in. I hope everything's going well for you. It's, uh, I really enjoyed working with you and your family. So everyone have yourself a great day. Make sure you get outside.